Okay, so the first paint we're going to be using is Tinny Tin. Now, obviously, you can use Walkblock Bronze instead if you want, but I prefer Tinny Tin. You'll be dry brushing this over every single one of these armor pads like this, and that should give a nice finished coat. After that, we go to Sycorax Bronze for the trim. Yeah, use a medium or a fine detail brush for this. After this, we'll be going to Castellax Bronze, and as you can see, there's a slight difference between the Forge Rod one and the Citadel one, and it's the Citadel one we're after. We'll be using this to paint the main parts of the armor panels which you can see here on either side of the world and the teeth the world itself we painted with hash nut copper after that we'll be using balthazar gold to layer up the main armor plates themselves it's still quite a bronzy uh, gold and it does look very nice in the end after this we'll be busting out dark star regency gold and that will be used to paint the main island parts on the actual world symbol itself Okay, then we're on to the airbrushing part. So everything needs to be base coated or undercoated in Chaos Black. As you can see, here's Angron and his body. Uh, he's one part. We need both arms to be uh, black first as well. We don't need to masking tape anything up at this stage. And uh, we're also going to be doing the wings. For Angron himself, I won't be pre-shading this time around. Um, instead, I'll be going through couple of reds and doing a lot of intensive weathering at the end with some oil buffs so to start off with I'll be using deep red from scale 74 and before anyone comments my airbrush is rusty and looking quite terrible my other one broke uh, here it is so I I was trying to tighten the end bit and unfortunately the nozzle snapped off in there so I can't get it out so I've got to get rid of it okay so obviously shake the red nice and well we'll be using airbrush thinner from Vallejo and one or two drops of flow improver there it is okay so all nice and mixed consistency of milk as always and do lots and lots of thin layers obviously you want to do this part in a well ventilated room preferably with an airbrush extractor and here we go straight into it so we'll start on the back of the elbow and build it all the way over the entire model nice and red it's a nice deep red. I use the same one for Cabanda as a base coat. And I do try to go a bit more zenithally with this. So it does add a little bit of natural shading. Now if anyone's on the fence about starting airbrushing, I started it a little while ago. And I started with a basic £130 kit, I think it was. Uh, one of these compressors from Amazon. And just a basic airbrush. Top, yeah, top loading one. And yeah, I'm, I'm still learning. So it's only about a week or two ago, I actually realized you could take the nozzle off the front to actually clean it. So up until that point, all my airbrushes have been getting gunked up and destroyed, but yeah, it's my fault really. I haven't been asking questions and uh, trying to learn more about this uh, method of painting, but it's, um, it's something I wouldn't live without now. Then the torso gets the same treatment as the arms. A nice deep red all over head as well try to get into the nooks and crannies and as you can see his face is already starting to look nice and deep and red and just be careful where you're holding him because you don't want your fingers to be rubbing off the paint okay now all red areas have been base coated and so you can see there's a few edges like on the edge there which will be brought up with the next layer of red but i will be trying to keep a lot of the under areas the dark red as well to add a bit of shading to it yeah, so you'll also have to use um, a bit of care when you're actually airbrushing around the muscles as well. You want to try to keep a bit of definition. So you'll try to keep the brighter reds out of the recessed areas and also try to keep the darker red on the lower parts of the model itself. The next paint we'll be using is Scale 74 Blood Red and it'll be spraying that on zenithally as mentioned. And here it is, a nice thin bright red. Okay, well, after that we're going to have a little practice on the bottom of this base. Now you're going to want to try to use a low pressure and slowly layer up the paint so you get a nice easy and effective fade. It's always worth doing this before you start on a big model just because you might notice that it's not coming out correct. It might be that the paint's too thin but you would get a nice little handle on how the paint is sitting inside the actual hopper right then and there. So. After a bit of a messing around, you're ready to go. It's time to flip the model over and get on it. 
So let's start by holding the arm against the model and work out where some of the natural shading will be. So we're going to be trying to get the back of the biceps, but not so much on the underneath. So let's do the back of this tricep and uh, the top of the arm. I don't know what the name of the muscle is itself, but yeah, right up there. There will be a shoulder pad over there, so I'm not going to go mad, but I just want to have a little practice. So then we go on to the tricep itself. Hopefully I'll try to maintain a bit of focus for this. There we go, slowly, low pressure, and carefully tease it onto the model. There we go. And continue. And then we're going to go on to the knuckles. Now, if you're very careful, you can actually airbrush out across the knuckles and across the actual fingers themselves to maintain a bit of uh, shading in the recesses. You can also see here the actual shading which I've left on the biceps and the arms from the deep red to the other red. And don't forget that we will be doing a lot of oil buffing in a little while to hopefully bring down the brightness of the red. So uh, if you think to yourself, oh, it's looking a bit too bright at the moment, just, uh, just bear in mind that we will be getting a lot darker quite soon. And what you want to do is just keep turning, the, turning it around, keep looking at it from different angles and just double checking how you think it should be sitting. So, yeah, like as you can see here, I'm holding from an angle, airbrushing slightly down, thinking, okay, I'm going to try to get the side of that knuckles because the light will still be hitting that area. And again, from this angle here, a bit more brutally, as you can see. That's the good thing about airbrushes, you can go nice and thick or very fine and uh, thin. Then we'll carry on with the blood red on top of the tail. As you can see, I've already done a bit already. So we're going to try to do a lot more red on top and then underneath we'll be putting a less of a layer. So we'll be taking it right up to the edge and trying to get a nice shaded effect on the, more of the inner side, which is going to have more, much more of a shadow, which you can see clearly there. After this, we'll be taking on the flanks. And if you're careful, you can airbrush directly top down and get some extra shading. There you go over some of his muscles slash ribs and uh, that comes through quite clearly and then a bit more muscles on the back there we go steady build it up towards the edges trying to keep it a bit darker in the recesses so there we go after that we're going to be jumping onto the face so we're going to be doing a lot of zenithal highlighting uh, with blood red from above and hopefully maintaining a bit of shadows with the deep, darker red. I would recommend that you keep changing the angles just so you keep an eye on where the shadows are and you'll quite quickly go, oh, add a bit more here, add a bit more there. That's looking not as red as this bit here. And then you will have a much better painted model. So it's only when you've actually finished going over the model at least once will you actually start noticing where certain levels of red are different to others and unnatural inconsistencies that's the bits you then go back and target so like right here i'm trying to get a bit on the back well, on the uh, side of the tail and also the back of the uh not thigh what's it called calf and with that the red is done now regarding the wings i will be quite tempted to do just the top of the uh, arms or well, i don't even know the best way to describe them these bits so I think they will need airbrushing to get a nice light level colour, but the um, the top of them won't. I don't think it'll be very effective. So I think I'll be doing them by hand, especially as it's quite easy to dry brush them up. So this is what they look like currently. And I'll be going over now the armour plates with Balthazar Gold. I've also done the trims in Sycorax Bronze. And then I decided I wanted to make a mixture of Castellax Bronze and Lamian Medium. There you go. And I was going to recess wash it into the uh, gaps between the armor panels or into the recesses around the armor panels and if you carefully do it like this and then get a tissue you can quite easily wipe it out and leave a bit of a dark grimy part in the recesses here we go let me just grab a tissue pop and you can always carefully you know tap it up and um, layer it up with a bit more balthazar gold if you feel like it's looking a bit too dark but um, this is a good technique for that. And then for the more harder to reach areas, we're still penning it in with um, a really thin, fine paintbrush. But um, after that, we will be getting out a 
um, uh, what's it called, Q-tip, I think, for the Americans, or cotton wool bud for the UK lot, just to try to get an extra bit of that residue out. Pop, and pop. You can also do a bit further up there as well on the other ones, so it is quite an effective tool to use. It also works really well on the main armour panels, so I'll be putting them all over this, apart from the cast, uh, what's it called, uh, Sycorax bronze areas. And here we go, let's paint it on. So flood it on, preferably in the areas where you want it to be a bit more shadowed. And then make sure it goes all the way into the edges of the uh, spikes and all that. And use cotton wool bud to sort of buff it off. Flip it from one side to the other regularly. And there you go, it brings a bit of a nice shine out. And also it adds a bit of a, a bit of a dark griminess into the recesses. And here you can see it's got a bit of a uh, shimmer to it. There you go, you can see the difference between the uh, original colour and the dull light. don't know if that's a proper phrase for it or what. There we go. And you can also use it on uh, recesses around the actual armour panel, so like here. There we go, so liberally put it on. And then, nice and quickly, get it off. Pushing it upwards or you can do it downwards to get a bit of a streak but it's not really a streak technique this one. So pull it up. If it yeah, you know, if it dries in a way you're not happy with obviously you can just do a very thin coat of Balthazar gold to get it back as well. After this we'll have a look at the upper thigh panel and hopefully we'll put a nice big coverage on that because you can see it's nice and shiny currently but we want to make that look a bit duller. So let's flood this colour on. Try and try to keep away from the um, Sycorax bronze. There we go. I also find this makes it look just that little bit more bronze as well. Okay, let's get some right at the top if we can. Oh. And then buff it off. And just like that, it has a lovely burnished look to it. Which I'm quite pleased with. And this is all just before the oil buffs as well. I also decided that the trim itself could do a bit of shading. Um, as you can see around here. And especially in the skull recesses and around the teeth. Or gums on the knees. So I'm going to use the same mixture, paste it all over it. Let it sit into the recesses a bit. And, and try to get as much off as possible. If you feel the need to bring certain areas back up, you can use Sycorax Bronze again. And then when you're happy, you move on to the next knee, try to get as much of that mixture into the recesses as possible. And then when you're ready to, take a cloth to it, or a, another cotton, a cotton wool bud, or a kitchen roll, and pull some of it back. And where possible, well, where, you, where you need to touch up again with Sycorax Bronze. There you go, as you can see, immediately starts bringing out the recesses. And then we move on to the chest piece, especially around the uh, ram horns. You're going to be quite reactive with that as you put it on, you pull it off with the uh, kitchen roll. Or cotton wool bud where needed. After that, we're going to be using Stegadon Scale Green to do the terouges and uh, yeah, all the flappy fabricy bits. So, obviously, going to thin this out slightly as well, a bit of water, just a very small amount. Pop. There we go. You only really need a, a standard brush for this with a nice point. And there you go. Go right up underneath the um, belt, up to the edge of the chains. Doesn't matter if you go over at this point because we'll be repainting the chains in a few minutes anyway. After this, we'll be using Surface Primer Black. And we'll be using this to paint on the fabrics around his waist. These bits up there. As you can see, oh, let's get it focusing. And pop. There it is. Right, so black all the way up there all the way around, see where the fabric is, 
and also on the hairs and his, which you find all over his body. And then we'll be also doing the butcher's nails. After that, we're going to look at the shoulder pads again. I used Castellax bronze just for the tips of the, uh, the housings for the spikes there. Don't know how else to describe them really. And then we used dwarf bronze or dwarf gold just to edge highlight them up right there. That's a scale 74 colour, it's really nice. And after that, we use Lead Belcher on the chains around his uh, midriff, Castellax bronze on the uh, tips of the uh, chains, as well. not the chains, the spikes as well, before a light dry brush of Lead Belcher over the top of them. So he's starting to look really colourful now. In the deepest recesses of the world symbol, we used Screaming Bell. And then on the golden parts, we used Dwarf and Gold again, Methyl Alchemy by Scale 74. Chosen that because uh, we want it to look a bit like this in a while, with a bit of verdigris, but obviously we're building to it right now. So it looks nothing like it currently, but it will. Then we used Dwarf and Gold, just for the edges of the um, belt itself. Then on to another shoulder pad. So, Castellax Bronze, all the way along the teeth, especially at the top, followed by Lead Belcher along the teeth themselves. Boom. To add it and make it pop a bit. So obviously I will be going over this with Verdigree in a while, but it's a nice base currently. After that, we use Balthazar Gold to do most of the axe itself, and uh, Lead Belcher for the top part for the mechanisms and the little back blade. Then on the sword, we also used uh, Balthasar Gold on the hilt itself, as you can see just there. We'll obviously add some shading to it in a second as well. We then use Sycorax Bronze to do a bit of edge dry brushing to try to bring out the edges of this axe itself. So you can see, just stroking downwards. So it actually appears more zenithal. Same as here, just from the top. Doesn't need to be too brutal, just a little bit of a tease to add a bit of highlighting. And at the end as well. We then build this up with Rune Lord Brass, just on the highest edges. So right at the top here, and there. Then after that we're using Metal and Alchemy Scale 74 Decayed Metal, which is a great colour. I use it for a lot of my um, old decayed metals, such as like uh, chains and the like, so I paint that onto every chain on the model, which is dangling, and then we'll do a light dry brush of lead belcher after that. Next we're on to Thunderhawk Blue, we'll be using this as a highlight for the Taruges. I would recommend thinning it slightly, and if you have a wet brush, a wet blush, wet palette, I'd recommend using that as well, because they are brilliant. So we're getting them all over the folds, as you can see here, and the creases and the, the naturally highlighted areas and every now and again you want to almost tap it on as well to give it a bit of a look of worn leather after that you're going to do a further edge highlight with Celestra Grey and Thunderbolt Blue mixed together 50-50 as you can see there it is and you're going to be just taking the highlight to a thinner level obviously you want a really thin or you need, if you can use the edge of your brush just like I'm doing here just to make it pop that a little bit more. After that, I really would suggest you use your wet palette. We need surface primer and storm vermin fur. So, a few of you might be familiar with this technique. Basically, put black on one end, and then you put the grey, which you're going to transition to, on the other end. So in this case, just there. Now, if you mix vertically which i'll show you in a second you can get a really decent blend uh, which enables you to paint it quite quite haphazardly from the palette straight onto the model which makes you feel a bit more reactive to um, the shading 
but as you can see we mixed it like that so it goes one way up and one way down there we go and i'm blending it through again so it gets darker as you go further along we'll be using this mixture here to uh, paint the black rags on the side of his waist so if we start off with the dark colors right there and just pick out the folds and the highest parts and then quite reactively we'll be dipping it between this color and lighter grays go, to help pick out the colors and pick out the folds better i really do recommend a wet palette for anyone who hasn't got one the good thing about them too is that the palette actually keeps the paint wet for days so you can come back to it days later and bam it's still fine ready to be used after a little while you might notice they start molding so you need to um, replace the sheets every now and again which is fine because they're really cheap and you can buy bulk, them in bulk and you can actually make your own ones as well by using i think it's baking paper and a plain like, kitchen sponge or it might be kitchen roll yeah wet kitchen roll on a plate with a, a baking sheet over the top of it apparently works almost just as well and then by the end of it you should be on the highest of the highlights and as you can see just ticking around the edges and there it's done on to the next one then after this you keep the mixture going we can actually use this again to complete the hairs which you see on his elbows yes he's got elbow hair and for this you can paint you know vertically across the hairs to add some easy highlighting and as you go further down or even further up you can use the lighter things to highlight the tips or the highest zenithal surface and here you can see the finished result we're after Then after that, we're going to be painting the sword white, as you can see here, completely fully white, and we're going to be making it look like it glows with heat. So the paints we're using is Dawn Yellow, Flash Kits Yellow, Aerial Yellow, which is a bit different in colour, and there's Troll Slayer Orange, followed by Everson Scarlet, and Charred Brown. And what we're kind of after is, as seen on this Wailing Doom here, a nice flaming sword, but with a bit more brown around the edges. That was painted by Honey the Destroyer, which you can follow on Instagram as well. So we start off with Dawn Yellow, and we'll be using this off of the wet palette and painting it right up to the edge of where we want the heat to be coming from. So the heat is gonna be glowing white near the center, so we'll be painting along the, butt, the sword edge, just there, near to the edge of the white, which we want to be showing through. Now I'll mention that uh, when we actually got to the end of this, I did actually think this was too bright for the model, because I was going for more of a grim dark vibe. So we ended up taking a lot of brown onto the metalwork itself before dry brushing with a very slight amount of silver and oil buffing, just to make it look a bit more grim dark. So you can follow this guide up to a certain point, uh, thinking, and if you do like it and you really want it to be a big, long, glowing sword, then yeah, it's perfect for you. But, uh, but bear in mind that we did decide to go a bit darker at the end of this. Uh, so hopefully you'll see that in the photos at the end. And there's the Dawn Yellow complete. Then we get out the Flash Kits Yellow as well mix them together on the palette as you can see and then where they meet I'm using that line to sort of stipple this onto the model as well and it's going to be a bit further away from the the highest dawn yellow line and it's going to be along here and that's what we're after a bit of a mottled look as you can see and we'll be on to the next paint now then we're on to the Uriel yellow. And it's not too much from there onto the orange itself because they're quite similar in colour. 
So here we go. Bits of spotted again. A little bit less though. And we're going obviously gradually further away from the hottest part of the sword. And wipe off little bits here and there if you need to with your fingers. It won't affect the uh, technique at this point. And then that's that yellow done. So now we're going to be going on to the orange. achieve a nice fade between the last yellow and the orange I'd recommend you start from the center there where they the two mix and pepper that on before you go a bit more brutal with the darker orange you can use the wet palette at this stage to jump between the yellowy orange and the orange um, to get a better fade because obviously that's at the end of the day what we're after then you'll get to a point where you're using pure Trolls Layer Orange and that'll be going right up to the edges. We're on to the red. So, as again, as with the previous step, mix the line between the orange and the red so you can quite easily get a better transition between the two. Then you want to start stippling it right at the edges so it really shows the heat right in the center is furnace hot. And you can keep tweaking the amount of red you have on it until you're happy with the end result. After this, we're going to be using a mixture of Troll Slayer Orange and Lamian Medium, followed by a bit of yellow from the palette mixed in, because we don't want to go too, too dark right in the center. If it does, it doesn't look right. So here we go, let's add some yellow on. Just enough to add a bit of a tint to it and show some of the skulls off and their details. And then, if you quickly wipe it off, you'll get a lovely effect. Then after that, we're gonna be using a bit of white to pick out the skull details to make it look like they're super duper hot. And the white we'll be using for this is a model air white. After that we'll be using an assortment of reds and oranges just to keep adding a bit more detail to make it look like the the edges are cooling a little bit more, a bit darker and uh, we just keep going along like that, little dot, little splotches here and there to make it look like they're separating away from the heat underneath. And as you can see we've added a bit of yellow and white as well here and there just to make it look a bit more balanced. Then after that, we're going to be using Scorch Brown, or I think it's Vallejo Modelaire Charred Brown, to add a bit of dried and cool, relatively cooled down, um, best way to describe it, floating flecks of the uh, dried molten metal. So dried molten iron pieces. And that's going to be like stippled along there, as you can see. And we'll gradually sort of bring little flecks into the center of the... Um, blade itself as well. And now as you can see it's starting to come to shape and there it is. All those relatively cool bits of molten iron. Just adding a bit of detail to that central heat from the blade. It's worth mentioning at this point that I decided against having it so glowy because I went for a bit of a grim dark model and this one this one did actually look a bit too bright for the model and it didn't go with the vibe I was going for. So in the end, I had a, in the end, I added a lot more of the uh, charred brown uh, to make it more of a metal blade. And here's me adding a bit more white to the central part of the blade and where it gets exceedingly hot. And you can see the skulls are looking even extra white now as well. And there it is, a nice white, hot, glowing blade. And then onto the axe. So for this, I'll be using Agrax Earthshade Gloss, and then also be using the standard Agrax Earthshade and a bit of Lamian Medium mixed with that Nylock Oxide for the central part of the um, the scully bit. Probably the best way to describe it. Here's the Nylock Oxide. I have to wait for it to dry for a bit. And here's the vibe we're after. 
So oh, let's get it in focus. There it is. And um, for that, it starts to look really nice, grim and old. So the best way to bring it up in the second is to use a bit of dry brush and a room lord brass. So here we go, we'll quickly dry brush that up. Ding, 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 bit of tissue, swirl it around a bit. I've only recently started using the disposable powder brushes uh, for makeup and they're really good. So this probably be the last time you see me using one of the Citadel dry brush paint or brushes themselves. So here we go, we're gonna be getting it from the top and just skimming the edges to bring a bit of shine back. There we go. Also to bear in mind where the uh, light's coming from. So he's holding this down. So it should be coming from the top of my fingers downwards. And there we have it. Just enough of a shine to be decent and warm. After that, we use a bit of iron breaker to dry brush the lead belcher. You get that nice and shiny, just on the edges, nothing too mad. Mainly because the next stage will be one of my favourite parts, which is blood for the blood god. So, I'm going to get some of this out on the palette. Now, a few times, there's a few different ways of actually sponging or you know, streaking blood on. I, I really do prefer the sponge technique, so that's what I'll be doing. To choose a bit of sponge, pinch it off, and then you're going to dab it in the blood for the blood god. Make sure it's all congealed and a bit horrible. The, the older the, uh, or the longer the blood for the blood god's been sitting, the more congealed and horrible it is which is why it's quite decent to use after a while. And then let's just get it all up there. You can do some streaks as well by sort of jabbing at it and like dragging slightly, but don't go too mad. Uh, just try to use a corner bit when you want to do that sort of thing. But there you go, it's looking suitably grim and horrible. But think of how far blood goes. You can do littler splats a bit further up the blades as well and even further onto the, the shaft of the main metal or the main... Uh, axe head itself. A shaft? Is it a shaft? Is it the pommel? Hmm. You know, the lead, the lead belt should be up there. And then you can also use the paintbrush as well to do little drags and streaks. Just like that, flick it carefully along. Also get into the bits that the sponge can't get to as well because that thing is going to be chewing up a lot of flesh and blood. Oh, come on, let's focus. No, not going to focus. All right, then. And there we are, two minutes later. Oh, let's get some focus. There we go. Nice and suitably bloody for Angron. So, yep, yeah, it's one of my favourite things about these sort of models is the amount of gore you can put on them, especially when you know they love it. Okay, now we get to the fun and terrifying bit. This is Pledge Multi-Surface Wax, and it used to be known as Clear. Now, obviously many of you probably know of that and probably have heard of it in circles out there. Uh, Clear is no longer available, especially in the UK. Um, but this one is, and it does the exact same job. And it's brilliant. Uh, I can't swear by it enough. In fact, we actually varnish every single one of our models with it nowadays at the end. So, we're going to cover the model head to toe in Clear one or two coats of it. And they'll be nice thin coats and they'll be let to dry in between. Now you can airbrush clear, which is one of the reasons why it's so good. But for this, uh, this time of night, I just could not be bothered to get the airbrush set up. So I chose a nice soft bristled brush and then painted it on. Two or three, oh, two to three coats is fine. I think generally if you want to be really, really protective over it, then go for three. But make sure that you let them dry between um, it does dry really nice and clear, even though in the top left corner it does look quite cloudy. It, it dries really clear. So this we painted on over every single thing, from the fabrics to the skin to the, uh, the armour panels and um, some parts of the weapons as well. Okay, so just to remind you, I have done two coats of clear and uh, in this one, half oh, of this video only, 
I'm bothered doing three and I'm going to now make a white spirity mixture which will be a little blue indigo and a lot of raw umber. Now the blue indigo is because it goes really well against red. So, see, there's this red skin. And it goes quite well against that as well, the armour. So, we're going to make a nice little mixture of this up. Now, what you're kind of after is a, uh, I suppose, a really thin gravy. That's probably the best way to describe it. And you don't want it too thin because it starts going away from the recesses. And if it starts pulling away from the recesses, you probably got a little bit too thin. So you just add a bit more oil paint in there. The good thing about oil paints is the pigments are so fine that um, they, they can be really easy to use and manipulate and get great effects with. So I also recommend using odorless white spirits or unless you're doing it outside. So as it's winter outside, I'd rather be uh, inside with odourless white spirits and a little crack in the window and outside freezing. So I'm using the last of mine up here to make this mixture. And using an old brush, I'm going to stab it around and manipulate it until it turns into a nice muddy mixture. Practice makes perfect. And uh, if you need to add more oil spirits, here, well, oil spirits, <laughs> if you need to add more uh, white spirits or um, oil painting at this point, you can. There we go. As you can see, a nice thin mixture. And you can see the white spirits pouring around on the outside. So you can always just grab it, white spirits, stab it around, thin it out a little bit more if you want. But you can see the mixture we're after. Then from this point here, we're going to grab our first armor panel. Should be putting gloves on, but I have forgotten to put them on clearly in this video. Stab it on, cover every single part of it. That's what I'm choosing to do anyway, because I'm really after a grim dark look. So smear it all on. And uh, the first time you do this, it is quite terrifying because you're just you're convinced you're making the biggest mistake of your life. Just remember those two layers of clear are very, very helpful. At protecting the paint which you've done and spent so much time on. And here I am with my gloves finally on, like a sensible boy. And let's just keep going. All the other armour plates across the entire model. I could film this and film this and film this, but I think you'll get very bored rather quickly, but you get the gist of it. Smear it on. So then onto the fleshy bits and the rest of the armor, as you can see, goes on quite well. Dab it on. And just keep going. At this part, you can see why I decided to go away from a, a very bright blade, because it didn't go really well with the grim dark, which is a shame. Oh well. And then we're going to do his face. So we're using the same mixture, but adding a little bit more white spirits to make it a little bit thinner. And there we go, let's get it on, slap it right there in his cheeks and all the recesses and shadow, everywhere there's a shadow. Okay, now I used a hair dryer, not a heat gun, to dry this. It's best to get it to a point where it's slightly tacky still, but not completely dry. You don't want it to completely dry because it's almost impossible to get it off, but also you don't want it too hot either, because if you get too hot, it starts melting into the... Um, to the wax itself. So you want to get it to that lovely consistency where it's easy to buff off. If you're a patient person, you can just leave it in an airing cupboard or somewhere nice and warm to uh, dry it off naturally. But if you're impatient like me and wanted to get this done, then yeah, a hair dryer is a good way forwards. As you can see, I'm using a cotton wool bud in this video to remove bits of grime. Now the cotton wool bud is good for um, you know, really small details. And the good thing is you can always pinch and pull off some of the hairs at the end or make them a bit rougher so you can get, a, um, get more into the recesses. After it's got a bit too much oil paint on, you can't keep using it because uh, it just ends up smearing more oil paint in. So you do have to swap them out quite often. The other thing you'll be using is old cotton t-shirts. So obviously you've got some things in your cupboard you want to get rid of. Grab some of them, go to town on them with some scissors, make yourself some rags. Now, 
on big tanks and things like that. A huge t-shirt is obviously really helpful. Um, but as you can see here, a small little corner wrapped around your finger is pretty damn helpful as well for this size model. And you skim the edges and it also adds a natural highlight to the edges of armor bits or trims because they're the bits where everything's going to be more worn naturally. The other thing you can do is add some white spirits to a brush, a clean brush, and then use that to flood certain areas and remove, you know, stick, you know, really stuck on bits of oil paint if you're not happy with it, to then bring it back to the clear level. But obviously, bear in mind, it can still add a bit of staining. Um, the other thing you can do is add white spirits to cotton wool buds as well. And I'd suggest if you do that, you do it really finely. Don't, so don't flood the cotton wool bud. Because if you do that, it will just take everything off and go straight into the recesses as well. Uh, it won't take off proceed past the clear layer unless you really start pushing into it. But you can also dab your finger with a t-shirt wrapped around it into a bit of white spirits and use that to buff off as well. So there's lots of different ways of um, either saving or adding techniques and textures to your model. So it's a lovely technique. It's a lovely technique from start to finish. Really forgiving and really, really effective. So then, as you can see also in the center, I've not gone onto the main world eater symbol because He's got it on his knee and one of his shoulder pads, and I want that to be more of a verdigris ridden um, weathering technique than a uh, oil buff weathering technique, because it goes well with the brass or bronze. So there we have it, the first armour piece finished, and I'm happy with that. That's the effect I was going for, nice and grim dark and nice and weathered. So yep, yeah, very pleased. And now I've got to carry on with the rest of the model. And here's the t-shirt technique on the cowl at the top. You can see it can be nice and effective. To, you can get that little mottled effect by just dabbing at it. Just keep bringing it back. And make sure when the model's finished, you leave it to dry in an airing cupboard for a very long time. And after, as soon as you possibly can, you can seal it if you want with your choice of varnish, depending on the effect you want after. Personally, I think it's always quite safe to go for a nice thin layer of clear again, or pledge multi surface wax. But very fun, and it is so therapeutic. <laughs> then for the muscles and the other fleshy bits, so grab a bit of old rag or t shirt and just Change it up regularly and just twist and twist and twist until you're happy. Buff and buff and buff. Twirl and twirl and twirl. Dab and dab and dab. Whatever you need to do to get that effect that you're after. And then for the difficult to reach areas, like knuckles and hands, just make sure you switch out to a cotton wool bud when you need to. And remember the advice on fraying the end of it if you need to, to uh, really get into those recesses. And that's as simple as grabbing a cotton wool bud, pinching the end off like that, pink, and there you can see, ruffle the edges. Get right in those hard to reach recesses. And also if you really want to start stabbing around in there with a brush with a bit of white spirits on, Really fine pointed one, one of the older ones anyway. You can use them to get the grime off of the central part of each of the flat surfaces. Don't go too mad though, because it starts looking unrealistic. And here's the arm with the bright blade. So, really enjoy doing that skull and the, and the chains on it as well. But as you can see, look how bright that sword is. Very nice, and if that's what you're after, then great. Otherwise, I'd suggest um, dulling it down and changing it to a bit more irony, like we do later in the video. And here I am using a bit of white spirits on a brush to bring off the central parts of each panel and make it a bit more 
bright, yeah, bring back the colour. But as you can see, if you go a bit too, a bit too much in certain places, it can look a bit, a bit poor. So you have to be quite careful. It's a bit of a balancing act. But you can always add a bit more white spirits if you're not unhappy. If you're not happy with it, not white spirits, oil paint. So the wings are the same. You jump between t-shirts and cotton wool buds with white spirits. There we go. Just to get it done as quick as possible. Just keep buffing, buffing, buffing. Yeah, this wing itself only took me four and a half minutes to do. It's quite nice and easy and effective. So now we're on to the armour itself and we're going to be using t-shirt again to pull off some of that oil paint so here we go buffing away nice and happy it's so good that it just has that natural shading to every single bit of armor or body or tail in this instance as well there he is he's starting to come together now i've done the knee with the skull on it pinch and pat get some detail off any bits you want to look really nice and worn and clean still, you just brush them a bit more. So that's the effect we're after. You can see we've done a bit more on the um, the chest plate there. It's quite difficult around the horns because you still want to keep some um, grime in the recesses, so you have to be quite light with that. Otherwise, yeah, because the detail is quite shallow there and you might rub it off too much. Then on to the Taruja's at the bottom of the model. So I'm using a folded corner of a bit of torn t-shirt here to dab it off. But then after that, I'll be going to town on it with a cotton wool bud. Just trying to bring some of that detail back, especially around the golden belt buckles and stuff as well. And then if we get a bit closer, you can see the effect we're after. And the good thing is it starts looking a bit like a, a nice leather as well. Really good. Still keeps a bit of grime around the uh, bolts as well. And um, in the little corners and recesses on the hanging spear tips. I don't really know how else to describe them, but hanging spear tips sounds fine. Then we're on to his back plate. Now I had thought about having a um, some infernal heat sort of emanating from the centre of that uh, vent in the centre of his back. I, I ran out of time, I decided against it, so I just um, decided to go through and just leave it as it is. I might add a bit of weathering powder, like some soot towards it on it at the end, but for now, just going to skip past it. Then we're on to his face, and uh, we're going to start off with a bit of torn cotton wool bud, bring some of that back. Here comes the red, as you can see. Swirl and swirl and swirl until you start getting his um his red features more prominent. Okay, so let's have a close up on his face. I'm quite happy with that. So obviously if you want it a bit more red, then obviously you can go over it again as well with uh some of the reds we used earlier. But if you're if you still want it a bit more grim dark, add more oil buff to it, or more oil mixture to it, and then buff it off again. Or you can just keep buffing until you get back to the red sheen that you're after. I actually found the tail the most um, disturbing part to do, actually. I found it quite difficult. So I, it's one of these ones where if I push too hard, it's going to remove the detail. But as it gradually like gets thinner and thinner along there and the detail gets more shallow it's one of these ones where you have to be quite on your toes about how far you've got to go with it otherwise you quite quickly find that you've actually buffed off all of the um, oil and it looks a bit too flat so take your time with this bit the most and uh, yeah just remember to over buff the edges where it's um it's nice and smooth just to add a bit of extra color 
Then after all that, I decided to go over it again with a uh, really frayed cotton wool bud to um, yeah, soften a few other areas. And yeah, uh, I was getting really, really pleased with it. also find this sort of step also unifies it slightly as well. So, getting there. No, actually, I think we're done. So now I have to just glue it all together. Great. So then, onto the base. I used uh, just standard building sand and a bit of rocks. I replaced all, well, the Primaris helmet with a series of Mark VI helmets, which I cut into and made it look like they're a bit damaged. And a few stones here and there as well. Nothing too special, but I'm not a massive fan of really detailed bases myself anyway. Uh, I like, yeah, my model's always primarily gaming pieces over uh, display pieces. And here we are. This is a good example of why I only go to a certain a certain length. Um, other people in the club obviously love doing uh, snow bases, big old fire pit bases, and the like. But I, I'm just I'm quite happy with just my standard standard muddy ones. So it's the next day. I uh, left the model in the airing cupboard overnight to dry and uh, I probably should be wearing blue gloves at this point because it can still leave fingerprint marks but I'm being a bit dense. So I'm using scale 74 dwarven gold to do the belt buckles and other little bits and pieces, other little flecks of detail here and there. And I'll go across pretty much the entire model finding these bits until I'm happy and satisfied. I then use surface primer, black, which is a nice easy thin black, to paint all the weird teeth that are seeming to be growing from every single part of his armour. And after that I'll do a nice edge highlight with a, um, a grey. Uh, also worth mentioning I went over the chains with a Agrax Earthshade mix of that and a bit of Lamian medium, just to make them look a bit more detailed and defined. I then use scale 74 dwarven gold to do some of the edges of the uh, dangly spears just to make them pop a little bit. Then we're going to be doing some weathering on the world eater symbols and we're going to be using a bit of nylac oxide for that. I normally use this and a little bit of water as well. Um, I like it to be a bit of a runny mixture. That you can use Lamian, but I think sometimes water is just suitable enough for this. There we go, straight on. The good thing is, if you, if you have a bit of um, every now and again, you might decide you want to grab a bit of extra water to thin it down or pull it off of certain surfaces. We can even use a brush or a bit of tissue again just to pull it back till so you've got the look you're after. So you want you don't want it pulling too much. It looks if it's too strong in certain areas, it looks a bit unrealistic. So as you can see, I'm gonna to try to pull that off of there and just smear it around in other locations. But also gotta make sure the teeth which are biting it don't actually have any on it because they're not um brass either or bronze. Brass or bronze. We then use it on his knee pad and a few little spots around his uh, belt buckles, especially around the um, the bolts themselves. And then in the morning light, I decided that I wasn't too happy with the face, so I wanted to add some extra colour to them, or colour back to it. So I made a little mixture of the two reds which we've been using throughout the project, and then uh, proceeded to edge highlight certain parts, just to make him pop a little bit more. So, yep, finest paintbrush you've got. And then just go to town on cheeks and uh, the little folds on his um, forehead, little wrinkles, little nose. Because models like this, they just need to pop that a little bit more because they are the centerpiece of your army. And there we have it. Those little extra bits of highlight made him really pop. Uh, oh, and let's fix up that little tail bit there as well. So you can always go over the rest of the model and anything you think you might want to add a little extra highlight to, you can. But yeah, pleased with that now. Just decided to do the back of his heels as well on this point. To 
especially along the uh, folds or the ridges. You can also add a bit of paint around his uh, muscly areas, add, add that little extra bit of definition, but also don't forget that um, there will be some shadowy bits which are meant to be a bit darker. But use it to pop out veins as well, make them really stand out. Then decided to use Rakar Flesh for the all the little sinewy pipes which go into his brain and across his armour here, there and everywhere. So I thinned it down slightly and uh, decided to go at each one individually. And then after this I will be using some inks to make them pop and maybe a bit of edge highlighting. But there we go. And after that we use Iron Hand Steel to do the uh, butcher's, the butcher's nails which are hanging out the side of his head. This will obviously then be dry brushed and inked a bit later as well. And now on to one of my favourite parts, gluing models. So uh, I haven't left any areas where I can actually use plastic glue unfortunately so I'm, I am using super glue which isn't the most ideal thing. So if you really want to, you can go over those edges and sort of roughen them and take them back down to the bare plastic. So you can you can use plastic glue. But yeah, as stated, I am using super glue, which makes them a bit more delicate, but it still works. Oh, that's just lovely. And then the accursed iron halo onto the cowl. Nice fit as well. Yeah, look at that. Brilliant. And then on to the base. I used dried bark as a base for that, all over and up on and into the recesses on the rocks. Then after that, we're going to be looking at the big old veiny bits which go into his head. And we're going to be using basilicum grey for them. So that's this contrast paint, which is just great so yeah just paint it all on and it adds that lovely effect and it actually goes really well with the grim dark vibe we actually use this on a lot of other things like um necromunda weapons as well um because it just looks so so effective and then on to the ones which go into his head his brain vein all the way down Leave a bit more re a bit more shading in the recesses and the bits which are open to the elements. Very cool. When that's done, you can add the cowl on to hide it all, which is just great. Now, my friend Engine Phil recommended that I stopped using things like um, yeah, screaming skull etc. for skulls. He's actually recommended light greys. So here we are. I'm starting using light greys for skulls. Never thought I'd do this, but I have to admit it's really, really effective. Especially for old looking ones. And then I got a bit caught short with a tongue colour. So I've used these three. Slash grey, Emperor's Children and uh, a nice thing of blood red to make a uh, tongue colour. There it is. His tongue. After that, I make a nice non oil and water mixture and arrange some blue tack. Now, the blue tack itself is for um, the skulls because I don't want them to be, you know, I don't want to hold them whilst they're drying, but I also want them to dry naturally. So, a few little spots of that, and then let's make, let's just cover them in this non oil mixture and then stick them into the blue tack so they dry hanging off the ground. And then don't forget the ones on his head. After that, we used Dawnstone to do the rocks on the base. I then made a little mixture of Rakarth Flesh and Corvus Black for the hooves. So, I um, spent a little bit of time researching what they should look like and decided this is probably the best mixture I could possibly go for. So here we go. And the good thing about this is we don't have to go too mad because we will be adding a bit of weathering powders over the feet in a while. So uh, let's, just, let's just get some colour on them at least. Add a little bit more Rakar flesh for the uh, ridgier parts as well. Just uh, 
add that extra little bit of highlight. I then continue to use this mixture to do the edge highlight on some of the uh, claws and the bony bits which protrude from the skin, just like here. So just on the edges using the flat of your brush. And this goes for the highest edges too. After that, we use a bit of um, scorched brown to do the leather straps on the back of his feet and a bit of and a bit of um, dwarven gold for the pins. Then we go on to some Balthasar gold for the um, horseshoes, is probably the best way to describe them, for the hoofs. That goes all the way on these bits here. The definition at the back is quite hard to notice, but um, I think if you stop just in line with the rear of the hoof, you, you should be happy. Then when that's dry, a nice dry brush of Rune Lord brass directly over the edges with a very fine brush. Well, not fine, but standard brush, just from a nice angle. Then when that's done, we mat it down with a bit of Agrax Earthshade. Then we turn back to the skulls. All right, now a light dry brush of Ceramite White, because it's a bit of a dry one in my collection at the moment. So. Use that to just flick over the edges to add a bit more definition to the grey skulls. There we go, popping nicely. And then back to the base, Gothgore Brown, dry brush all over. There we go, nice and dry, and all over that base. And this is the first of three paints we'll be using over the brown which we set up right at the beginning. And this is followed by a lighter dry brush of Bane Blade Brown. So let's get some extra excess paint off there and get it onto that base. There we go. Then finally, a light dry brush of Carrick Stone. So this is actually the technique which they used to use on all the four job models uh, back in the day. I don't know if they still do now. So all these colours are the same mixture that Forge World used to use on their heresy ones. And I love it. I still can't fault it. It's my favourite one. It's my favourite painted base colours. Then after that, we're going to be using a Agrax, Null Noil, Water and a bit of Lamion mixture to shade all the rocks. So that's just pasted all the way on. Where I don't like it, I pull a bit of uh, the liquid away. But yeah, it's a, it's a nice easy way of making the rocks look a bit more realistic. Then some more Ceramite White to pick up the skulls and also the um, helmets, which will be Blood Angels eventually. And to achieve that, I'll be using the contrast paint, Blood Angels Red, which goes on really nicely over white. Then after that, you glue on his chain dangly bits all across his body. And yeah, getting one step close to being finished. Then a bit of Seraphim Sepia, where you feel like it, watered down if needed be, onto some of the skulls to make them uh, a bit more tarnished, a bit dirtier. So you can obviously choose the age of them by adding more or less of this Seraphim Sepia. Obviously they get bleached in the sun as well, that's why they turn a bit more grey. After that we glue the wing on, here we go. Plop. I'm using super glue again, uh, obviously, but it's, it is better to use plastic glue. But I had no time or inclination to do that at this point, because I was, it was getting late in the day again. Very quickly followed by his arm. His other wing. And his other arm. And there he is, completed. So you can see why I decided to eventually go back and uh, change the sword, because it is very bright on the model, which is a quite a grim dark model. So all I had to do to, to fix that was to go over it again with charred brown and uh, a little bit of a dry brush of silver to make it look like it was still molten iron. But um, that's a simple enough thing for you to do and work out yourself. So I won't bother showing that in this video. 
but yeah thanks for watching i really hope you enjoyed it and that was my um angron painting guide uh, hopefully you will subscribe thank you bye